The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. So, um, uh, sorry, I can't talk about a lot of topics. What I'm going to do is just introduce complex system science in a couple of slides. So this is, uh, you recognize this? The matrix. So the matrix is the world as data, right? Implicitly. So when you do statistics, traditional analysis, you take two different numbers. These are like time series. And you correlate them with each other. And when you want to study something else, you take two other time series. And you correlate them with each other. So in complex system science, the key idea is to look across the entire data and understand patterns that are present in the data. And that really enables us to think about different kinds of questions uh, and to gain different uh, kinds of insights. Now, I don't really have uh, time to talk about a lot of the topics. I'm just going to mention a few things that we've worked on, um, kind of give you just the punchline, and I'll have to ask you to kind of look up more details. Um, and then I'll say a few things about sports, since that's why we're here, right? So um, Arab Spring, one of the key questions is, why did this happen? People often think about dictators and other things. So here's a, a, a better answer, uh, we th we, as we understand it. This is global food prices, as measured by the UN. These are food riots, and this is the Arab Spring. Uh, the blue dashed line is the date we submitted a report to the government saying high food prices, social unrest, political instability. That was four days before Mohammed Bazezi started things in Tunisia. Um, let's talk about the causes of that, high food prices. So we traced that back and we found out that the reason was because of collective behaviors on commodity markets. So this, the blue line, is again the food prices. Now, the red line is now a model. It's actually a dynamic model. It's not constructed by correlations. It's actually a dynamic model that has the effect of US ethanol policy in it. So this is corn that's being used in your gas tanks. This is a government regulation that specifies how much ethanol is produced every year. And the rest is buying of commodities based upon trend following. Price goes up, that drives price up more because people buy based upon trends. And um, that kind of modeling is not done in economics because they study based upon equilibrium behavior of markets. So this is actually dynamics of markets. Um, this is a, a thing we did also on sort of um, collective behavior on markets. We're looking at sort of collective action, actually panic, or panicky behavior on, on stock markets in this case. So up, this is a parameter that measures this up is sort of calmness, down is panickiness. And down here, what we've done is sort of measured the difference in panickiness. Panickiness is going down, sorry for the choice of sign. Panickiness is going down, and what I've done here is I've marked when panickiness increases by two standard deviations, which is statistics properly used in this context, and I've marked when that happens, and here are all the largest one-day crashes in the markets. So not surprisingly, if you know how to measure it, increase in panic precedes panicky behavior on markets or panics on markets, so we can do that. Um, I just had to show this here. We have also modeled European bond crisis. Um, Spain is included. Uh, we can actually understand the dynamics, which was a follow-on effect of the financial crisis. Can't talk about it here too much. Here's another uh, topic. This is um, a simple dynamical model of a pathogen evolving. Um, so the red is the pathogen eating up the 
green as hosts. And it's evolving, it's becoming more aggressive at times. And what I want you to notice, the brighter color is the more aggressive one, but the brighter color as it spreads then uh, will disappear. I'm not supposed to ask questions. Can you tell why it disappears? Why does a more aggressive one disappear? The answer is because it eats up all of the hosts in a particular area and runs out of hosts. Now what happens if I add long range transportation in this model? And the answer is it will escape to other places. So as you add more and more long, run, long range transportation, you end up having worse and worse pathogens. Does that make sense? So we use this in 2006 in a paper to describe not just a gradual transition, but a sharp transition from survival to extinction of a global population, and then warned about Ebola uh, uh, eight years before Ebola happened in West Africa. Okay, so the idea here is that if you understand the nature of the important variable in the problem, and you can characterize how change is driven by that important variable, in particular transitions in the collective behavior of the system, you can anticipate things that might be surprising otherwise. Here's the other stuff. This is um, social media data showing people waking up, going you know, to work, going to home, and going to sleep in New York City. Uh, we can do this globally. Here's, um, uh, again, if you watch before, not before morning, people are sort of uh, going to sleep. Uh, and we can do things like watch people talk to each other uh, globally, which is kind of fun. Um, and uh, we can understand sort of the social dynamics of the world. We can also zoom back into New York and tell how people are feeling. Uh, so this is a, um, an affect measure that tells whether people are happy or sad or saying positive or negative things. And it's uh, not going to be surprising that people in green spaces like Central Park are happier than people near sewage dumps or sitting in the airport waiting for their plane. Okay. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about sports. So we haven't done a lot of work on sports, but there's one thing that a student came to me, uh, wanted to work on, so we did a little bit of preliminary work. I would call this a step, step zero or step one, if you will. So what we wanted to do was to think beyond the ideas of individual one-on-one -on -one play. So thinking about one-on-one -on -one play is something that people have thought about a fair amount, but we wanted to think about this in the context of soccer. What is the importance of player, multiple player interactions, if you will, or really what happens when uh, you think about it from the point of view of many players. And so we came up with this very, very simple hypothesis, which is that if you have more players in a particular area, you're going to have an advantage. Does that make sense? It's pretty straightforward, right? So we're going to do a case study of one, one game of soccer. Uh, data, uh, I, this is just a picture I downloaded from the internet a few moments ago, but the, the data comes from actual data of a particular game, okay, locations of players. Uh, what we did is we partitioned the active field. So we didn't take the whole field. We took the active area in which players are located and partitioned it in this way. So there's a front, middle, and a back, and two side areas. And we simply counted. That's all. We just counted the players in those areas. And we counted them for team A. So this gives you the percentage of time there are different numbers of player in each of those areas. See, this is very straightforward. And we counted the number of players in team B in each of those areas. And then we did the same thing at every moment in time by taking the difference. So we didn't take the, the players of A numbers and the players of B numbers and take the difference. At every moment in time, we took the difference in each of those regions and we plotted that. that this is what our really is our objective here. And what we found out was something very 
uh, very straightforward, which is that the teams are not symmetric. One of the teams, it turns out, team A, so A is attacking this way. So this is A's defensive area, and this is A's attacking area. Um, and we found out that A has more times that it has a dominance by multiple players, let's say by two players, as opposed to equal number of players in the defensive area. And also has, so compared to this, where they're equal, you see that? Equal means that they're just as likely to have an even number of players in the offensive area. And of course, they, they, they also have some times where they have a dominance, which is more than they have a deficit over here. I uh, guess what? Team A won this game. So based upon a single case study, which we did not replicate with other games, we were able to predict which team would win. But I thought we would do this informally for a game that might be familiar to some of the people in this, in this audience. This is a game I looked up. I can show you the game. It's, it's a game of uh, Barcelona against Madrid. I'm sure many people already know this, right? You got that? It says there, right. Okay. So we looked at, I just, I just got online, and you guys can help me with this, but as I understand it, I'm just gonna look and count the number of defenders versus the number of offensive players in a key area. And I went through and I picked out just a few moments where there was an attempted goal. There was no goal here. This is, um, this is Barcelona attacking, right? And there was no goal here. So there's just a few instances of sort of normal play. This is, um, this is, um, uh, Madrid attacking, and there are clearly many defenders, right? So you can look through this. I don't know how much time I have left, but we can look. Look how many defenders there are compared to offense, right? Uh, white versus blue and red, right? And again, and again. And what I wanted to do is to go to the last slide I have here. There it is. This is the winning goal. Okay, shot the other direction. Right now, Barcelona is attacking this way. This ball is gonna get to the goal. All right, how many offensive players do you have in the key area versus how many defenders do you have? Okay, proof by example. Anyway, I thought you might enjoy this. Um, I actually had a good time going through these 10 best goals of 2016. I don't know that you want to see this, but you can actually tell pretty clearly, um, and I don't want to take the time, but you can actually tell pretty clearly that at least from very few cases, it's quite surprising how, how common uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, preference is. Okay, this, the opportunity for goal clearly arises more readily when you have a local dominance uh, in, on the field. Thank you, that's all I have to say.